Good morning. Good to see you all on this snowy day. How many of you like snow? I'm one of those weird people that just, yeah, we're here in Colorado. Good. At least half of you like snow. Uh, that's a good thing. Well, it's already been mentioned a couple of times, but I want to mention it again. Uh, this Wednesday evening, we have our second iteration of our One Thing Praise and Prayer Service. Our desire as a church is to build a deeper culture of prayer, and we want to become a house of prayer. Of all the things that a church can be, this is the one thing that we must be. We must be a house of prayer, and we believe as we seek the face of God together that he's gonna open up his hand and do some really neat things uh, in our lives and in our church. So uh, I hope you'll make that a priority. It's the most important meeting of the month. And I mean it when I say that. The most important meeting of the month, and for those of you who are thinking right now, but I have kids. Uh, Hey, that's okay. I have kids too, and we have babysitting available that evening. So uh, come on out. Make it a priority. Uh, Put it on your calendar. Now, my best guess is that uh, no matter what you might think about this Brett Kavanaugh uh, controversy, it's been uh, swirling around for, oh, at least... uh, Uh, Three, four weeks now, it seems, with the hearings back in Washington, D.C., those things have been settled. But no matter what you may think about it, uh, whether you think he should be on the Supreme Court or not, uh, if you're like me, you're probably just glad it's over, right, that the question has been settled. I've seen so much frustration and so much anger on both sides of the political spectrum that it's just absolutely exhausting. And of course, as we would expect, it boiled over on social media, it reached a fevered pitch on the talk shows, the radio talk shows, I mean, venom like I've never seen before. And uh, a confession, as much as the whole thing just kind of wore me out and wore me down, I couldn't stop watching and I couldn't stop listening. So one afternoon during my lunch break, I decided to listen to a little bit of radio And as I was listening, the host of the radio show said, Dave from Davenport, you're on the air. And he began his talk by screaming. He just went, ah! And that voice went out over the radio waves. Uh, Dave had been watching these hearings back in Washington, D.C., and he was frustrated You could tell he was super frustrated and all types of questions were swirling around in his mind. Why is this happening? Why is this process unfolding this way? Why? This whole thing doesn't make sense to me. And so he talks to the talk show host for a couple of minutes and you kind of have this positive sense that, uh, you know, Dave internally has uh, turned a corner and he's been talked off the ledge. Then at the very end of the talk show, he just goes, ah, again, and he hangs up. And you know, honestly, the the moment was kind of cathartic for me because I felt the same way as well. And maybe we need to all stand up this morning, no matter what you think about the whole thing, but just the frustration that came with it, maybe we need to all stand up this morning and just go, ah, and let some of it out so we can relax. Uh, Whether events in Washington, D.C. had you wrapped around the axle or not, I'm sure you've felt that way at one time or another about a whole variety of different issues. As you turn on the evening news, what do you see? Uh, Contention and strife, people unable to agree on, it just seems, the smallest of things they argue about. Uh, You could get out your phone, you could get out your pad, and you could check your news app wherever you go for your news, and what do you see? I mean, weekly stories about children being abused, uh, ethnic tensions around the world being stoked, uh, Christians in different parts of the world being slaughtered where it barely makes the news here in the West, uh, religious leaders of all different types covering up all different types of things, uh, racial injustice making lasting peace uh, seem almost impossible, widespread government corruption at the level where just the select few at the very top cash in while masses of people are kept in poverty and difficult life circumstances. 
And if you're a thoughtful follower of Jesus, if you've taken any time really to consider and to think about what's happening in our world, if you believe that God is all-loving and he's all-powerful and he can do all things and he can do all things easily, if you take a look at that, then you take a look at what's happening in the world, you should say to yourself, ah, occasionally. You should have those moments where you say, why don't you do something, God? Why don't you intervene? You don't make sense to me. You're perplexing. Why, God? Why? It's the question that echoes through the centuries and through the ages with the problem of evil and suffering that we see in the world, with the fact that God is good and he's loving and he's all-powerful. The why question is a big question. It's a question that has turned some into atheists. It's the question that many young people wrestle with. You know, they live in the bubble of home and then they leave the bubble of home and they go off to college, wherever they're going, and they're filled with all types of questions. Why God? And all of us have our doubts sooner or later. Uh, if If you don't, if you've never asked that question, if you haven't, soon enough you will. And I can tell you that there are no easy answers to that why question. Indeed, the godliest of believers sometimes have asked themselves that very question. God, I don't understand your ways. I don't understand the way you operate. I don't understand why you run your universe the way you do. And if Job, a very godly man, asked three times, he said, God, tell me why. I want to know why. If Job asked three times and he never got a satisfactory answer, then what answer can you and I expect? As we look at the Bible, uh, there's no single all-inclusive answer. In Genesis, we find one answer. One answer, we move to the book of Job. We find another answer to the why question, and still another answer in the Psalms. And with Jesus coming into our world to suffer and die in the Gospels, we see another type of answer that changes the way that we think about everything. And finally, by the time we get to the book of Revelation, at the very end of the Bible where we see it declared the victory of Jesus over all of the forces of evil, the final defeat of evil, we have another type of answer. And all of these various biblical perspectives, they don't contradict one another, they actually complement one another. The question of evil and suffering and why God is this world this way is so vast, it's so big that we need all of these different perspectives to help us wrap our minds around it. And this is where the book of Habakkuk comes in. We're gonna start a new series today in the book of Habakkuk called When God Doesn't Make Sense. And in this series, we're going to dig deep into this little book. It's just like a postcard in the Minor Prophets, and it deals with the time in the life of Judah right before the nation imploded. Now, if you don't know where to find Habakkuk, let me give you a little bit of help here. Uh, It's right in between Nahum and Zephaniah, (laughs) okay? Okay. Uh, You know, I have one of these little yellow post-it note markers here in my Bible, and you might want to do that too. It's hard to find, or just turn to the white pages, turn to the table of contents, find uh, the book of Habakkuk and mark it. Now, Habakkuk is an interesting book. Uh, Unlike the other prophetic books in the Bible, it records a dialogue between Habakkuk the prophet and the God of the universe. Uh, You can think of it kind of like a call in talk uh, radio show, if you will. God is the host and Habakkuk is the caller. And he calls and he says, my God, ah, why don't you do something? I don't understand you, God. And if you've ever felt like you've had a question for God like that, uh, this is the book for you. Although Habakkuk takes place in about 609 uh, B.C., his day and age is a lot like our day and age. After the good King Josiah died, King Josiah was a revival king. He brought revival and reform. He was a good king. He brought good things to the people of Judah. But after he died in 609 B.C., the nation slipped back into idolatry and corruption 
and just went the wrong way really quickly. But this time around, it's a little different because the people have hardened their hearts in sin, and this time around, they're determined to live without God. And so we have Habakkuk entering the scene. Uh, This guy with a funny name that we know almost nothing about. He has a ministry during a very difficult time where the people are plugging their ears and they are not concerned for the law of God. They're not concerned about their relationship with God. He looks around and he sees a society that's crumbling. And we know that he was a contemporary of Ezekiel and Jeremiah and that he would have been 10 to 15 years older than Daniel. And he looks around and he sees this terrible moral and spiritual decline in Judah, and he prays to God. He says, God, would you do something? And he probably thought that God was going to raise up another good king like Josiah to to rule and reign and to lead the people in the direction of righteousness. But little did he know that God, yes, would answer his question and would answer this need, but he's going to answer it in a way that makes things worse rather than better, at least in the short run. So Habakkuk lived in troubled times. And I think it's safe to say that so do we. So we would do well to sit and to listen to Habakkuk for a few weeks so that we can find a strong faith when the world doesn't make sense all around us. Habakkuk is a very simple book, three chapters, the flow of the book of Habakkuk goes like this. Chapter number one is argument. Argument, he's questioning God. He comes to God. Chapter number two, for the most part, is God's answer. And chapter number three is acceptance, where Habakkuk comes to terms with what God has told him. And along the way, as Habakkuk questions God, as he talks with God, he moves from ah, I'm frustrated, to okay. He experiences a total change, a total transformation in this book from fear to faith, from burden to blessing, from worry to worship as he comes to God and as he's honest to God with his questions. Uh, The book begins with a question mark and it ends with an exclamation point. And in so many ways, like I said, this is a very modern book because it raises the same questions that we wrestle with today. I think we all have been there. Why don't you do something, God? Whether it's something in the world or whether it's something personal in our lives, we all have had those times when we've said, why, God? Why don't you do something? So let's begin with Habakkuk chapter 1. We're going to begin with verse 2 today where Habakkuk lodges his complaint He comes to God and he says, why don't you do something, God? And specifically, he's confused and he's agitated about two different issues. Uh, First of all, issue number one is prayers without answers. Habakkuk has been offering up prayers and he says, God, you're not answering me. Look at verse two. He begins, O Lord, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save. Very relevant question. I mean, take a moment to consider what's happening in our world today. Corruption, injustice, abuse, neglect, war, sexual perversion, human trafficking, violent crime, and the same things are happening in Habakkuk's day and age. And as he looks around him and he sees evil in every direction, he cries out to God in prayer in these opening verses. How can you let this go on, God? Why why don't you do something? Answer me. And I wonder if he got to the point where he was frustrated and he even thought, you know, God, answer me. Are you even there? Do you even care? And sooner or later, I think that all of us say the same thing. Uh, Whether we'll say it out loud, whether we'll admit it or not, we have this confusion in our hearts about God's 
apparent inactivity in the world. Have you ever said to yourself, maybe you'd never say it out loud to people at church, but have you ever said to yourself, where is God when you need him? Where are you, God? A wife prays for her husband who has terminal cancer, but none of the treatments seem to halt cancer's cruel advance. And he dies several months later, leaving her with two small children. A husband prays for his wife who has said, yeah, I do want to be married, just not to you anymore. I do want to be married, but to somebody else. And a husband prays diligently, but the divorce papers still come through the mail with a little convenient post-it notes to show where to sign quickly for a quick and easy divorce. A godly grandfather uh, prays for his wayward grandson who was raised in the faith by godly parents and godly grandparents. He knows all of the right things, and he goes off to college, and in a matter of just about six months, everything that he has known, everything that he has been taught, he turns his back on. And he walks away, and mom and dad and grandma and grandpa have been praying, but to no avail. He shows absolutely no signs of coming back. I think we all have our frustration with unanswered prayer. And so we cry out like David, the psalmist, cried out, Why, O Lord, do you stand so far away? And David's describing his, his experience, that you seem to be so far away from me. Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? And what are we really to think about these heartbreaking tragedies that are a regular occurrence in our world? Have you seen the news for the last two weeks? I mean, really. Just yesterday I saw on the news that a Mexican couple just south of the border are accused of killing and dismembering 20 women in order to sell, get this, their body parts. They were found, get this, pushing a baby stroller filled with body parts that they were planning to sell. You saw the week before last, 20 people killed in a limousine accident in upstate New York. The driver, 17 passengers, and two innocent bystanders who were there wiped out. The crash was so horrific that it rattled even the longtime investigators who always investigate those types of accidents. Or maybe you saw the news recently where a bride in Evansville, Indiana, uh, Jessica Pageant, who took wedding photos by herself on what was supposed to be her wedding day with her fiance, a guy named Kendall Murphy, a firefighter who was killed by a drunk driver, and get this, you know who the drunk driver was who killed him? Another fireman who was drunk who showed up at the scene and hit Kendall and killed him. So this lady takes pictures of what was supposed to be her wedding day standing by her fiance's grave. And Paget says of her slain fiancé, quote, he was a selfless man of God who loved spending time with his family and friends. What about these folks? Are their lives not valuable too? Are their lives not precious? When we see things like that in the world, we along with Habakkuk, I believe that we are entitled to say, Lord, where are you? Lord, why don't you do something? Uh, If you have never asked that question before, it must be that you have lived a very sheltered life or a very privileged and pain-free life, or you just have never adequately wrestled with this dissonance, this cognitive dissonance between an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God who can do all things and the evil that we see in the world. What are we to think of that? In these unbearable situations of life under the sun, This is Habakkuk's complaint, and it's the complaint of a lot of people. Oh, Lord, how long, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? That's the first issue Habakkuk is dealing with, prayers that have been unanswered. He says, why don't you do something, God? You don't make sense to me. And the second issue is out of control perversity. He looks around and just perversity is out of control. 
Uh, Habakkuk's world is a lot like our world. He complains to God that everything is perverse, that up is down and down is up, black is wide and wide is black, good is evil and evil is called good. Look at verse 3. He says, God, another question, why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Uh, God, you could do something, but apparently you prefer just to sit idly by and allow evil to run its course and to have injustice triumph. I don't understand you, God. Destruction and violence are before me, he says. Hey, question, do you have any idea how many people were shot in Chicago last year? 356 people were killed and over 3,000 people were shot in the city of Chicago. And that's amazing. Strife and contention arise, Habakkuk says. Again, turn on talk radio, take a look at social media. It seems like all we can do is argue with other people and disagree, and those people that we disagree with, even on the smallest of issues, apparently we can no longer be friends. So the law is paralyzed. Literally, it means to be put on ice. It's frozen. The law is paralyzed, and get this, injustice never goes forth. It, it, it never goes forth. Can you sense Habakkuk's frustration here? Justice never happens. Man, it never happens. The wicked always seem to get away with it. God, I don't understand you. It, it, justice never happens. The bad guys always seem to win. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. You see, Habakkuk is having a meltdown here. A little bit of a meltdown, a godly man meltdown. He's going, ah, why don't you do something? Why don't you answer me? I don't don't understand why you run the world the way you run it. Everything is perverse. Everything is out of control. Everywhere I look, I see violence and I see injustice and I see corrupt leadership. And the law of God is being neglected. And I keep hoping things will change. But man, things never change. Wicked people never get punished. I don't understand you, God. And he's frustrated. As you take a look at these verses, can you sense the pathos? Can you sense the emotion? Can you sense the frustration of a godly man? Can you sense his anguish over a broken society? Maybe you're beginning to see the relevance this book has for our modern audience. Now, if God were running a talk show radio program and we heard this question of Habakkuk, I think we'd go, ooh, good question. I mean, how's he, how's he going to answer that? And God will answer Habakkuk, but in a way that he's not expecting. And we'll look at what God has to say, how he answers Habakkuk's why question. We'll take a look at that next week. But I think it's good for us this week just to hang in the tension a little bit and not to snip the tension and not to move on too quickly. We need to, yes, we need to deal with the why question because it's a great question. It's the question that strikes fear in the hearts of believers when non-believers ask us that question. It's the question that keeps many non-believers from becoming believers. It's the question that causes many skeptics to say, if there's a God, he sure has some explaining to do. Those are the exact words of Robert De Niro at the Tribeca Film Festival. Then he went on to say, church is not for me anymore. Why? Because of that question. It's the question that causes many Christians to be disappointed with God and wonder if he's really good. Yeah, we sing what we sing and we say what we say, but in the deep inner recesses of our hearts, do we really believe that God is nothing but good all the time? It's the question that caused many who profess faith in Christ to eventually walk away because the dissonance in their hearts just gets too big between what they experience in this fallen world and what the Bible declares to be true about God. It's a great question, God, why don't you do something? And you know what, God is a big boy and he's more than able to answer that question if he would like to. And next week we're gonna take a look at how he answers that question. We'll let him speak for himself. Uh, Like Paul Harvey used to say, next week the rest of the story. But today we're going to live in this tension of Habakkuk. 
And while we wait for God to speak, I want to offer up three biblical principles that we need to keep on our radar screen as we try to maintain faith in a troubled world. As we take a look at what we know is true about God and as we consider what we experience in our own lives, what we see on the evening news, how is it that we are to think about it? How should we maintain faith? I want to look at this before we let God speak next week. Uh, First of all, during troubled times, prayer changes us, not necessarily our situation. We need to realize that because this is a book where Habakkuk is bringing his prayer to God and we see Habakkuk brings that to God and his situation never changes, but God changes Habakkuk through the process of prayer. And I think that's very instructive. As Habakkuk looks at his world around him, violence, corruption, lawlessness, he begins praying. And through prayer, Habakkuk, not his situation, begins to change. And Habakkuk is never unbelieving in his words to God. But it comes to him and he's just honest to God. He says, I'm really frustrated and I don't understand why you do things the way you do them. And in his honest opening prayers that we see in verses 1 through 4 and through God's eventual response, by the end of the book, he learns a better way to live, whatever future circumstances may hold. Through prayer, Habakkuk changes, even though his situation doesn't change. But God does change him and gives him the grace and the faith that he needs to persevere in perplexing times. And just a word, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that we have a tendency to make when we don't understand why God runs his universe the way he does is we stop pursuing God. We stop talking to God about it. We run the other direction. When when the windshield of your life is pitted and shattered with pain and you're processing everything through your pain, and you're having a hard time seeing God as being good and loving and involved, rather than running away, you need to press in. This is exactly what Habakkuk does. He comes to God and he says, you know, God, I don't understand. And the book of Habakkuk shows us that God delights in the prayers of his people. And look, he may or may not give you an answer, but here's the deal is you're pursuing him and you're telling him that you're struggling. He's going to hear that, and through your prayers, he's going to change your life. And he's going to bring you into alignment with his will. Our prayers may not change our situation, but they'll change us. And as we see along the way, Habakkuk experiences a complete transformation in his perspective because of prayer. So through prayer, not through a change in his situation, he moves from fear to faith, from burden to blessing, from perplexity to praise, from confidence to confusion, or excuse me, from confusion to confidence, and from worry to worship. Through prayer, God gives Habakkuk the grace and the faith and the strength that he needs to make it. So when you're going through difficult times, don't pull back. Like Habakkuk approach God. Uh, Secondly, during troubled times, God calls his people to trust that his purposes for the world will prevail. Habakkuk says, God, why do you idly look at wrong? In other words, he says, God, I don't see you doing anything. From my perspective, you're not doing anything. And as the book unfolds, we see just how wrong Habakkuk was. God is doing something far beyond what Habakkuk could ever see or imagine. God is doing something that's absolutely going to blow his mind in chapter 2. But when God finally does answer Habakkuk, get this, he reveals a certain future for which Habakkuk must wait in faith. Okay, he has to wait in faith. And God tells Habakkuk, look at chapter 2 and verse 4. He tells Habakkuk that the just shall live by faith. That's the key verse of the entire book. Underline it, highlight it, put an asterisk next to it, whatever you need to do. And that is such an important concept and contribution that this dialogue between Habakkuk and God makes to our understanding that it's actually repeated three times. In the New Testament, those who walk with God through the tragedies and triumph of life will have to trust that his purposes will prevail even when all of the evidence that we can see is to the contrary. 
Hebrews chapter 11, what chapter is that? It's the heroes of the faith. We have the Old Testament heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11. Okay, this is God's honor roll of faith. These are people who lived by faith, people who were commendable for their faith. And even though their stories are all very different, what do they have in common? This. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them from afar. Okay, every one of these heroes in the honor roll of faith had to believe that God's purposes for the world would finally and forever prevail over evil, over obstacles of all type, even when there was overwhelming evidence to the contrary that they could see. In other words, we walk by faith. We don't walk by sight. And as your heart breaks because of violence, corruption, injustice, envy, and strife, you're gonna have to take God at his word. And that doesn't mean that you, that doesn't mean that you disengage from the world around you. Rather, it means that you thoughtfully engage, doing your best to represent God and his grace and his truth, trusting that a day is coming when all of God's purposes will finally and forever prevail. You live with the knowledge, get this, that just because you don't see God doing something doesn't mean that he isn't doing anything. Habakkuk teaches us that because Habakkuk says, God, I don't see you doing anything. By the time we get to chapter two, we say, oh yeah, he's doing something. You may not necessarily like it, but he's doing something. I mean, a great illustration of this is Good Friday. What do you suppose that Mary thought as she sat there and saw her son bloodied, beaten to a pulp hanging on the cross? What do you think went through her mind? I imagine she thought that this is a travesty of justice. I imagine that just like Habakkuk, she had a few questions for God. I imagine maybe even she said, God, why don't you do something? And what was she met with? Silence, silence, but what do we know? We know that where God seemed to be most absent, he was actually most present, doing a most profound work, bringing about a gracious triumph, a gracious victory to redeem and to restore all of creation through that moment of salvation history and question if God can take the greatest evil and he can turn it into the greatest good, can't we trust him that his purposes will prevail for our lives and in our world, even when we can't see it? Uh, Third and last, during troubled times, this is key. Don't let what you do know about God to be undone by what you don't know about God. Let me say that again. Don't let what you do understand about God to be overshadowed by what you don't understand about God. When it comes to the problem of evil and suffering, hey, there's a lot that we don't know. There is a lot we know, but there's a lot we don't know. There are a lot of mysteries. But as we search the scriptures, there's one thing that we see again and again and again when it comes to this problem of evil and suffering, and it's this that he's not the God we think he is. He's much better than that. That in our times of brokenness and pain and despair, when we're tempted to think that God is something less than perfectly good, that we can't trust those feelings, we can't trust those thoughts. That he's not the God we think he is, he's much better than that. During our times of disappointment with God, when we're tempted to think that he's something less than perfectly good, the Bible tells us that we're always wrong. In the book of Genesis, Joseph says to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, for the saving of many lives. In the book of Ruth, Naomi, after losing her husband and after losing her two sons, she says, God's God's against me. God is against me. That he's not a benevolent God, he's a malevolent God, that he's out to get me, he's ruined my life, but what do we see? 
We see that God was doing a work that transcended her lifetime and exceeded her wildest imagination. As he was reversing her situation, he was also providentially overseeing the development of the royal line leading to Jesus. So in her pain, in her moment, she could not see anything that God was doing. But he was doing something huge. In the book of Job, Job loses everything, and three times he says, God, I want an answer. Why don't you answer me? And when God finally speaks, Job says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. When Jesus dies, three days later, the anguish turns to what? Wonder and to worship. And the apostle Paul says, yes, uh, the world is filled with suffering and it fills with evil that our world is groaning. It's groaning right now, but he also says, Even though suffering and evil is part of all of our lives and all Christians, the Bible tells us we have to suffer, that some suffering has been appointed for us. But he also says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for those who are called according to his purposes. So we have Joseph and Naomi and Job and Jesus and Paul and Habakkuk all telling us the same thing that he's not the God we think he is, that he's much, much better than that, that we cannot trust our moments of pain when we process and we consider who God is through our pain and through our experience. Loved ones, don't let what you do understand about God to be overshadowed by what you don't understand about God. And I understand some of you are probably hanging on by a thread this morning hanging on by a thread because of the situation in your life, whatever it may be, you're hanging on by a thread, and even though you're not saying it on the outside, even though you're nice and put together and you look good this morning, on the inside you're going, ah! And you're you're right there. You're on the cusp. And you don't see God doing anything in your situation. Maybe you've begun to doubt the goodness and the love of God. And maybe you've started to think, maybe all the things that I taught was taught, and maybe all the things that I thought I knew about God, maybe those things aren't really true. Maybe God really isn't involved in what concerns me most. If that's where you're at today, then you need to have your belief in the goodness of God renewed. And my prayer is that for all of us, through our study of Habakkuk that we will see this, that God is nothing but perfectly good all the time. Uh, How many of you, just out of curiosity, have ever been to the Sistine Chapel? Anybody ever been there? A few of you, okay, quite a few. Uh, We have a picture of it here somewhere. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Uh, The Sistine Chapel is one of the true jewels of the world of art. Uh, After spending years painting it, Michelangelo finally finished this masterpiece in 1512, and then the chapel went into uh, daily use right around 1512. In those days, the only light source they had were candles, okay, candles, and candles burned year after year after year, and as these candles burnt, the soot began to rise up to the ceiling, obscuring the paintings, after, get this, 400 years of grime and dust and uh, uh, soot collecting on the ceiling, the art needed to be restored to its original condition. So they had a team of restorative artists who came in and started working on the Sistine Chapel from 1984 to 1999 to redo these paintings. And so they came in and they worked on it until the monochrome colors were restored to their original beauty. And prior to the restoration process, many in the art community thought that Michelangelo was a master of composition, that he was just a genius. After all, how did he think? How in the world would he ever think to have Adam's hand stretching out, yearning for the hand of God, which was already reaching out for him? I mean, that's amazing. But it was also widely believed that even though he was a master of composition, that he was just a mediocre painter. Uh, that it really didn't have the best of coloration. It was too dark, monochromatic, and blah, they said. And so when they restored these frescoes to their original state, everyone could see the beauty and these fresh spring-like colors that just popped in an amazing way. 
pale pink, apple green, a vivid yellow, sky blue against a background of warm pearly gray. When the maker's true brilliance and goodness were revealed, people had to change their assumptions about Michelangelo, and they had to say, yeah, he's a master of composition, but he's also a master of coloration. He's a master artist. He's really good. And in a similar way, for many of us over the years, the soot, the grime, the the dust of daily life has obscured and clouded our vision of the goodness of God. Uh, God's character seems to be blah, mediocre, maybe even dark. And maybe for some of us on the inside, deep down, we really do not deeply believe anymore that through Christ we have a good, good Father who is in heaven because of what we see and what we experience in this world. And my prayer is that our time in Habakkuk changes us as we bring our concerns to God. May our time in Habakkuk show us that God's purposes for this world will prevail, no matter what it looks like right now. May our time in Habakkuk teach us not to let what we do understand about God to be overshadowed by what we don't understand about God. And may God use this time by his spirit to remove all of the grime and the soot and the dirt from daily life that obscures our vision of just how amazingly good he is. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the book of Habakkuk. Holy Father, show us just how completely good and trustworthy you are, uh, even when we don't understand, even when we don't see you at work. May this time in Habakkuk be a medicine chest for our souls uh, during these troubled times in which we live, Father. Father, And we ask, by your Holy Spirit, would you fully renew our belief in your goodness? And may we learn to trust in you completely in all circumstances of life. And Father, for whatever different questions we may have here about how you run your universe, I pray that we would be encouraged to seek your face in prayer and that you would meet us in those places and whether we get an answer or not, that our perspectives would be transformed so that we might live uh, grace-filled lives, lives that persevere to the end. Our Father, we thank you and we look forward to more time with you. In Jesus' name, amen.